There it is. Damn tall. There we go. Welcome to the January meeting of the BBAA. And did you guys say, uh, is Rich on right now? Yeah, I'm right here, bro. Okay. Oh, there you are. <laughs> um, Wait, you thought I might skip town uh, <laughs> right before uh, the official, the transition occurs? That's how I would do it. <laughs> I'm not that smart. Hey, Chuck, I found the key to the uh, post office box. Well, that's good. Didn't so find it. Where'd you find it? Uh, it was in one of my computer bags. <laughs> but I never did find the uh, credit card. Oh, well. well, we haven't had any ahead. odd charges, so. No, it's in the house somewhere. I just don't know where. <laughs> I never took it out of the house. <laughs> it might still be in your wallet. Who knows? No, it's not. <laughs> I've even changed wallets since then. George, go ahead and give your uh, VP report to start us off. Oh, yes. Uh, let me uh, let me get in there. Here we go again. That's a, that's a screen sharing. And, and you sent the file because I don't see it yet. OK, let me see here. Oh. <laughs> Oh, I've got it. Yeah, I've got it. Well, I'll tell you what. <clears throat> I cannot get into... Uh, hang on a second. I'm on my wife's old computer, and all of my buttons that I have selected are not there. So I'm going to have to go into my Chromebook and pull up the... Uh, George, you just want to display the, catalog, the uh, calendar? Yeah. yeah, one of us. Hold can on, I can get it real quick. Oh yeah, okay. Somebody else can do it because I can't get that on the on this computer. Okay, I'm going to share, and I should have it here in just a second. There's not a whole lot going on. Okay, you should see the screen. Yep, we can see it. You see yeah. that? I see a blank screen right now. Yeah, I I we see it. see it. Anybody else see it? No, yeah. we all see it. I don't see it. It's a zoom. See it, can't read it. Okay, let me try and make it bigger. Oh. Mine says Zoom meeting, not responding. I have a blank. But we don't need George to read it to us. We can see it and read it for us. Yeah, we, we can see it. It's a little small, but we can see. I'm going to get in there. You need a 32 inch screen like I got. <laughs> it's not working. Let me try something else. Hold on. Yeah, that's working. Keep going. Yeah, see it. Is it zooming? It's not zooming on my screen. Yeah, it's zooming. Yeah, it's zoom. That's probably good right there. Yeah, it's yeah. the box. It's the standard events. Can you read it? No. Yep. Yeah, it hadn't really. I don't think it changed. Unfortunately. That's good <laughs> well, that's stupid. But yes, I can read it. <laughs> I can read it, but it's not very big. Where I come in zoom on my screen. Quick way to zoom on, on a browser is use the control plus or minus. Plus it'll go bigger, but minus it'll go smaller. Yeah, but he's, he's got a Mac, though. It's, uh, oh, it's a Mac symbol something he had it up there when he went to zoom it's got the shortcut keys mac man, he's running ios on a, a chromebook no okay i'm back on my chromebook the computer locked up i can't it it, it would not let me do anything in zoom it said zoom meeting not responding on okay. my computer so i'm not back in the chromebook and I, I got your PowerPoint. I'm re ready to rock when you, whenever you're ready. Okay. I guess you already uh, did. You already look at the calendar. Yep. We, yeah, we saw it. I'm getting there again. Oh, how come I don't have it here? Let's just treasure report. Oh. 
Do you know the dates without looking at the calendar, George, or do you need the calendar up? My cal if I I don't know the dates, I have to go downstairs and get my paper calendar. I want me to do that. And he can do the treasurer's board. Let me go get the paper okay. calendar. Can you read that one? Uh barely. Just yeah. One yeah, that one was good. Let me uh, okay. Obviously, you can see tonight's meeting. Tomorrow is corn watch. Uh, night watch is Saturday. Next Friday is corn watch again. The 16th is sky watch. Uh, on the 21st, our Gordon Garden Stars was canceled. On the 23rd is uh, Saturday, Sunday. And that takes you through the whole month of January. And then our meeting starts again first Thursday in February, which is the first, uh, the fourth of February. Corn watch on the third and sky watch on the fourth of Feb. Um, Sunday on the 27th of Feb and night watch, I'm sorry, night watch on the 13th and sky Sunday on the 27th. And that takes you through February. So there's nothing else going on. We had uh, a, a, a Garden Stars scheduled, but it was canceled on account of the COVID restrictions. And uh, I did get a request for something at the Portsmouth uh, Naval Support Activity in March. So I'm hoping that will take place. <laughs> That's it. All right, George, thank you. Um, next up, we got uh, Jeff with uh, Secretary Report. Oh, okay. Let's see, my notes for, um, I understand that George has, I don't have anything on the computer. I'm doing it by paper, so I don't have, you gotta listen to me here. Um, right. My question, first one was for Stripers for um, December 11th, 2021. And I understand that George has already reserved that room. Yep. Is that correct? Very yeah. good. Thank you, George. Great. And I understand Chuck has secured the corn watch permit for all of 2021. That's correct. Very good. I do not have the permit yet for Chip Oaks for 2020. That, that was going to be my next question about Chip Oaks. It has been sent. It's been paid for. They have cashed the check but I have been unable to get a hold of them on the phone to find out where it is. Usually they send me, they, they usually send to the post office box um, the permit at which time I look it over, make sure they didn't make any gregarious changes to it, sign it, and we keep one copy and send the signed copy back to them so it's on their file. But I haven't received it from them. I sent it to them back in September or early Well, October. we're only seven days into the new year, so... Yeah, but next but, uh, weekend is the first. Right. Chip Oaks is on that. Well, we can show up anyway. It's easier to get forgiveness than permission. Yep. And they yeah. usually check on us anyway. You know, I, I just, have never had them ask for the permit, ever. Me neither. Yeah. I've been there. Anybody that's going, make sure you check the uh, the Night Sky Network and get all the, the I think it's a parking permit like this, I believe. Am I correct? It just says. Yeah, you're supposed to put that in the windshield. And yeah. I don't even think. I don't think I've only done that once or twice. I did that once, and I mean, it just got in the way. <laughs> but anyway, I don't think anybody's going to have any problem. As long being as you there. pay your, as long as we pay your parking deal, which is now I think it's what seven dollars a night. It's more than the four that it used to be, but I think it's like seven dollars. For parking. Yeah, but I understand if you have a state permit for the year. Yeah. For the parks, you should yeah. be able to use that. Hey, I've got one. Okay. Um, all right. What else I need to do? With um, do we want about the picnic on July the twenty fourth? Do we want to have the picnic again at Elizabeth River Park? Yeah, I would suggest that. You would. Yeah. Everybody, I don't, I, am I overstate? I don't know if I'm, the president should be asking these questions or not. No, you're fine. That's it. On that uh, flow chart that uh, Chuck had made up, this is what you're supposed to be doing. That's fine. Right. Well, I, that's would, what, I would say until somebody objects, 
stay with Elizabeth River Park. Yeah, I think it worked out well. What you need to do is you have to uh, contact the parks people. Yeah, that's the city of Chesapeake. Right? City of Chesapeake, and the closest place to go in and actually do it at from where you are is to go down and get off on Greenbrier, go all the way down to Volvo, hang a right on Volvo, go left at the next light, and just down about a half a block is the city. There's a Chesapeake um, city office down there that's open. It's open seven days a week. And you can go in there and you can get your dog park tags. You can reserve shelters. You can do all kinds of stuff there. You can't go, you can't pay any city, anything else in the city, but park stuff and recreation stuff. And that's about it. Do you know what the fee is for reserving one of those shelters? Um, it's going to be about 150, 100. I'd have to look in the checkbook, but it's, it's about 200. Hold on a minute. I can tell you. Maybe. Chuck, well, we can do this. At, yeah, I mean, well, I'll send you an email. Yeah, we can do this it's, offline. I mean, it's either 130, yeah. 160, or 260. Okay, we're just we getting never the got an honorarium that. check from them last year either. But I guess my question would be you know, are we agreeable to go there on the 24th of July? So. Yeah. Well, we hopefully, we hopefully we're all vaccinated and uh, things will be halfway back to normal by that time. Um, Chuck, Chuck, don't they give us some kind of a break because we do all these activities for that? No, we get no break. But what we're supposed to get the year, the two years before that, we got an honorarium check for about a hundred bucks that helps offset the cost of the to the, to the uh, park. But last year we didn't get an honorarium check, and we should probably check with uh, what's her name? What's our girl that comes out and babysits us? Hey. With your wife? <laughs> That's what, that was where I went first. Why don't you just turn your head and ask her? Yeah, <laughs> she's in the other room watching the Hallmark Channel. Still. Oh, that that that's that's bad stuff, man. Do you know how many she logged all of them? Really, Chuck, what we need to know is what is the latest that we can reserve like that you would recommend? And if we do reserve and then we have to cancel because of COVID again, is it reimbursable? Well, if you the, the rules on, on cancellation are you have to cancel, you have to give them, I believe it's either 30 or 60 days notice to get your full refund. You need a fourth majeure clause. Yeah. Need a COVID clause, exactly. But um, I mean, if I mean, we, it's just if we could cancel enough in time. Well, you'll probably know in May what's going on with the vaccine and everything. Right. And we're gonna I, let me happens. make a note here. What I can do is, you said it's the twenty fourth. That's what the uh, calendar shows. Twenty fourth of July. Twenty fourth. Well, the calendars. I'm sure that George copied that date over, but it doesn't have to be the twenty fourth. Just so you well, what it, you don't want it to be on a day that we have sun, Sunday, Saturday on Sunday. Yeah. <clears throat> you don't want it to be that day, and it, I would avoid the night a night for Sky Watch and Chip Oaks also. I've got the calendar open. I can look real quick too and see. The tenth is Night Watch. Sky Watch is on the 3rd. Saturday, Sunday is on the 24th. Oh, it is? I don't want to do it on the 24th. Probably, no, okay. Probably okay, the 17th is probably the best one. You want to try that to go one with nothing? Nothing scheduled for the 17th. All right. Let's so we want to try to change just the 17th then. Right, we got 17th or 31st, but I'd shoot for the 17th. Yep. So what I'll do, to, I'll do tomorrow. I have to go up there up that way anyway to deposit two checks I got in the mail. Um, I'll stop into that Chesapeake office so <clears throat> so um, he doesn't have to drive all this. So Jeff doesn't have to drive all the way down here. And I'll reserve the 17th and uh, find out exactly what their cancellation is, and mm -hmm. then we can plan from there. Okay. Hey, I'm all for that. Appreciate it. Thank you. Did you say you could pay right there, too? What? Did you say you could pay? I right can pay there? him, too. 
if the cat's yeah. leash of uh, date is like 30 days, then I suggest we just you just pay them and reserve that date right then. Right, because if you if you if you blow it off and say, oh, we'll go back later, somebody will forget it. Yeah, and then you'll go, it'll be June, and you'll go in there and try and get a summer re rental vacation, yeah. a rental. It'd be all booked up. Look at you and laugh. Right. Because I got a feeling, you know, people are going to be, once this COVID thing's over, they're going to be very eager to get out and start partying and <laughs> taking these right. things. Yeah. Just like me, you know. <laughs> um, and that's all I've got on my... Uh, did you have a summary of uh, last month's meeting, Joe? Um, I put that on the website. I'm pretty. Uh, um, normally, we do. You, normally, it's suggested. Do we want to read it? We may. Most of the times, we don't want you. Make a motion that we dispense of reading of the minutes. I second it. All in favor? Aye. 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 Go we'll look at them if you want. All yeah. right. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I uh, made a pretty uh, pretty uh, exaggerated uh, report when you say last posted meeting. them on the website what website um website. put it up on the it's up on the um the bbaa site <laughs> which Ash. one we have three of them four oh. of them. facebook or groups io no it's not on facebook .org. it's on our um, um back bay astro .org. Back bay astro .org site that's the one okay and then if you look under um, documents, you'll see meeting notes and that's where um, they've been posted to. Okay, that's good. All righty then. Hey, look, there's Benito. Next, we'll just roll right into the treasurer report. I'm not sure which one of you guys is doing as a Rich or Chuck. Let's we haven't turned over yet. I'll get the next one. Okay. All right. You should be able to see my screen. It should be big enough. Yep. All right. This is today. We got seven. We have uh, in the general fund five thousand two hundred twenty-three dollars eighty-four cents. Primary scholarship seven hundred eighty-three dollars and twenty-nine cents. And the Georgie June scholarship fund is a thousand six and four dollars. So our total is seventy-six. Hundred and eleven dollars and thirteen cents. Um, uh, George's idea for people to uh, help fund the scholarship fund. Here, let me. Well, this is this. That's not very. It's been pretty successful. I should have brought up a different spreadsheet. Hold on. It's coming. It's too late. But it, it was rather. This is just the books for this year. This is last year's books. We got a general fund scholarship income. That's how many people have donated. Oh, that's cool. As a part of George's challenge. And um, so Check that's pretty PayPal. good. Check your PayPal. I got another one in there. So. Anyway, it's it seems to have worked pretty well so far. And somebody, Mr. David Reed, gave us a hundred bucks. Thank you, David, if you're on here. So, whoops, that's not what I wanted. So we go back here to the state to the totals, and as far as the membership drive, um. We have 142 members, obviously. There's 126 members whose dues are okay. We have seven members whose dues are due this month, basically, to, to accommodate for the whole year. And 33 people still dink. Um, I would bet that out of these 40 total that are haven't paid, we'll probably get at least 20 of them will pay. I'll send another nag note tomorrow. And every week until the end of January, they'll get another nag note. And then uh, after January, it'll be up to Mr. Rich to write them all off, whoever hasn't paid. And uh, we'll probably end up, last year was the first year that when we wrote everybody off that hadn't paid, last year was one of the first years that we dropped, we stayed above 100 
full members or 100 members. Now we may stay above that again this year too if uh, enough people pay. Well, we should. We're already at 126. So. I was going to say, we're already looking good. That's good. Yep. Our club has grown over year over year. Yep. So that's good. Even during a pandemic, that is good. Yep. And um, so I don't have any other questions. Uh, Jeff, I'll send you a um, – um, Jeff and – President, man, I will send you a PDF of this sheet just so that you have it. Okay, great. I'll put it in, incorporate that into the minutes for. Uh, okay. For this meeting. Anybody have any questions about the um, books? I have a question. Do you have to move to Colorado? Yes. <laughs> you know, it snows out there. Lots. The good news is he can't do the books from Colorado. I've, I've pitched that multiple times. <laughs> Are you selling plots? Did you get that? Want, 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 want response. Uh, are you are you are selling observatory square footage? Um, not yet. Okay. You know what I might do out there? Since it's a dark sky county, basically, area. Yeah. yeah. And this and the city has its own observatory called the Smoky Jack Observatory. It might be a good idea to rent telescopes. Dobsonian telescopes. Oh, yeah. Buy about 10 8-inch in telescopes what? and then give them an hour's worth of instruction on how to do an alignment and a couple eyepieces and take away the adjustment or lock the adjustment screws on the the, you should put a roll off out there and sell some real estate because if you ever looked at the prices from New Mexico Skies and Company, oh, I know, outrageous prices. So you could make a killing, I think. Well, let me. I've tried to convince my sister that we needed to do something like that. Here, let me show you something simple shack roll off, and then you know, everybody can have their 10 square feet. <laughs> yeah, not even that. If we go here to. Sweet. See that? That's a great nice. a little bit bigger. All right. This is looking due west from where my house slash observatory is going to be. As we pan off to the north, see that big open field? It's about 70 acres, 60, 70 acres. Wow. We own about 90% of that. You have to cut that tree down. No, you can't that's do that. My, that's that's a nice spruce. That's, that's a, a nice spruce. Alignment. That's just polar alignment. Yeah, that's my polar alignment. This gap is my polar alignment gap. No. But anyway, there's an awful lot of space out there. You can see it's a little slanted from about right here to up at the head of this park up here. It doesn't look like it, but it it goes from 80, 8,500 feet to 8,900 feet. There's, there's about a 500-foot climb between where I'm standing and where the head of this park is. Wow. So what's your altitude? Well, I'm standing right here at 8,600 feet. Wow. Boy, you're going to get some blood cells, red blood cells going there. <laughs> There's my southeastern wow. horizon, guys. Beautiful. Wow. Those, those mountains are about a, about 800 feet below me. Creepers, creepers. So that looks really nice, but the western horizon kind of sucks. That one's third, that one's almost fourteen thousand feet. Better than my backyard. Yeah, much yeah. better than mine. You don't have <laughs> a house in the way. You see this house down here? In the winter time, when I was a kid, we used to put a ladder up in the front and we'd climb up on the roof and then sled off of the roof <laughs> onto the snow bank that's back here. And that would take us out about out here into this park somewhere. The snow comes down, blows down off of this park and drifts against this side of the house. So, all right. Let us know when you got the square footage on the roll off. Yep. Well, I'm I'll thinking about a, panels and batteries. I'm thinking about a 24 by 24 roll off. There you go. So I can be like Ted, have my <clears throat> 18 inch daub assembled out there and have my imaging rig 
on a couple piers and be good to go. Even the telephone pole is below my horizon. <laughs> Beautiful. All right, done bragging. All okay, right. Okay, so. Okay, I'm done with the uh, treasurer's report. Let me figure out how to stop sharing. Check your Here's the uh, next. We got uh, uh, Ben, if he's got anything to add. Uh, no, I guess, no. Okay. Scholarship okay. report. Oh, sounds like we're going to have enough money, so we'll we'll get a number out and then get the form out probably next meeting, get it approved, and get it out to everybody. I have a lot, another thing to add <clears throat> as treasurer. Somebody's going to have to start going out on a regular basis to Lynn Haven and getting mail. I'm glad I found the key. Yeah, I, I still have. I've, Sean should have a key. You should have a key. Um, I have Kayla's key, so we'll give that to Jeff, but that's a pretty long haul for Jeff. It's a pretty long haul for everybody, pretty much. Yeah, I was going to say, uh, Lynn Haven, uh, that's going to be well over an hour for me. Wow. Oh, yeah. Like so, Lynn Haven Parkway? Cool. Yeah. I live near Smithfield. Yeah, it's oh. right around the corner from where your office is, Ben. Yeah, it's real close to Well, I think you got to make Ben the secretary or the, or the treasurer. There we go. Yeah, I guess I'm not ready for office right now, so. You can be the official mail getter. Is this the key? Maybe. No. Is it wrong? It nope. looks like a post office key. It does. Yeah, look I'd, like I'd be top. glad to help out if you guys need need it. That literally is. I go by it every day. The mailbox key is kind of long. It's like that. Yeah, it's a long, funky key. Yeah. There's oh, a long, crap. funky key. I better look for it if I don't have it. <laughs> anyway, what I, I can do it. is. Tomorrow when I are, are you gonna be in your office, Ben? Yes, sir. Tomorrow when I go get the mail, I can drop a key off to you if, if okay. the president is in agreement. Well, that sounds good as long as Ben doesn't mind. I mean, you didn't have to go do anything. I mean, the you're get the most regular thing you see is um, IDPA asking for donations and a monthly bank statement. And that's usually what you get. And, and the really, bank is, the bank is available electronically. Month, right? And the only time I check it, I used to check it on a weekly basis, would be in April and May while we're looking for scholarship applications. Right. And then, then in December and January, I generally checked it on a weekly basis to check for checks. And after that, it's like once a month. Okay. But I have no reason to drive to Virginia Beach anymore. I don't work. Oh, did I mention that I have zero days left? I've been retired since Friday. Congratulations. Yeah. Join the club, I did. All right, that's all I got, I promise. All righty. Well, Ben said he didn't have anything to add for now, so we'll go to Bruce with the Alcor report. Hi, good evening, everybody. So um, I'm going to start out with, uh, so who on this call helped organize the BBA event at Coreland for the conjunction? Anyone? Anyone? I think it was George. George Reynolds. George. Always rise his hand. All right, George, you are eligible for this uh, special AL Great Conjunction Special Award. See the link that I posted in chat. And I look forward to your submission. Uh, in addition to your urban uh, observing award, which I look forward to seeing that. So everybody, hey, work, George is working on an award. Let him be your example. So urban observing, and then he's going to submit <clears throat> for this awesome, great conjunction special award as well. Uh, now, if you're lazy like me and didn't show up at Coraline because of the uh, weather and driving all over the place, wherever Chuck decided to and meet George at whatever school he went to, although that was, I'm sure, fun and awesome. You can get this great <laughs> downloadable certificate uh, where you can write your name in, okay, and have a nice commemorative uh, boobadabber for your efforts, because I, all I did was go out with binoculars. So um, anyhow, uh, in addition, uh, the Alcor apparently has been having some submission issues. 
So off their website, um, they basically say, if it's been a month uh, since you sent a certificate request to one of the observing program coordinators, uh, send them an email, ping them to ensure that it was received. Because apparently some of them actually do business travel. So um, yeah. So if you uh, send a paper submission or it's electronic, uh, make sure that you uh, uh, coordinate with the coordinator. So on the Astronomical League website, if you go to their observing programs, every program like those two that George is gonna submit for has a coordinator uh, with their email and contact information, okay? Hey, Ben, did you ever submit your award? Yeah, I was about to ask you, so, so PDF it and send it directly? Uh, for you, yes. Okay, I, I bound everything together because there's so many and you had to draw so many, so for the double stars, so I'll, oh. I'll unbound in PDF. Well, yeah, I, th I think in, in, in the, the COVID era, you know, I do not want to be a uh, <coughs> uh, bottleneck. OK, so uh, yeah. truly, um, you know, uh, you, you guys are, are adults and you know what you're doing. And a lot of them, you are amateur scientists uh, of some note. So uh, I would just hope that you would not submit trash uh, for the BBA. And I know you won't. So um, if you want me to look at it, I, I would love to look at George's because I might want to do the urban things. That's kind of uh, my interest. But anywho. Hey, Yep. My story? Yeah. I started on the urban list in 2003. <laughs> and I have not touched it for at least 10 years. <laughs> and I found my list just the other day. And I thought, oh, I must have about 30 left to go. I only had five objects left to complete the list. I said, cool. oh, I got to do this. I got to complete this list. So I went out last night after midnight. And I only had five left to do. I got three of them last night. And the others come up later after like two o'clock, three o'clock in the morning. Okay. And the sky was very muddy last night. I could barely see any stars, but I got three open clusters last night. Awesome. So um, George and I always look for BBA awards in the back of the award-winning uh, magazine for the Astronomical League Reflector. And sadly, there have been very few, uh, but we would like to change that. So um, I, <clears throat> in the Georgie June's uh, tr tradition, I'm, I'm trying to be as enthusiastic as her, if that's even possible, but uh, I would like for everyone to uh, uh, make a, a New Year's resolution to get at least one award this year. Usually if you participate uh, a lot in public, outreach you know you can get a, a public outreach pin um i ended up with one or two of those but anywho log your hours on um uh Life sky network that thing um and uh you can be eligible for that okay so um uh since bird has not been handing out cool um monthly sky charts uh, i have been receiving pretty cool monthly spy charts sky locator charts from Merrill, Mid-East Region Astronomical League, not feral or anything associated with small rodents in the desert. Um, this is Merrill. So anywho, they sent me this very cool uh, Uranus locator next to Mars for this month. So anyway, I've got those sitting around. If there's a place I should post those or send those out or whatever, or I'll just, you know, uh, send it via snail or uh, snail email. Let me know. Where, where could I post those? Any, any ideas? Uh, if you want to send a link on, on to this um, uh, Zoom call. Put it, put would, it in the chat. Help. Send the link in the chat. Yeah, yeah. the chat. There you go. Uh, can't. Go to groups.io. Groups.io. There you go. Yeah. You uh, post it on the Facebook. Or you can save the file to the chat. It's right there in file. Just add file if you if you PDF them. Uh, I have I have PDFs. Okay. Well, well, can I something that's not as uh, um, temporary as this chat? Where what's the one person at a time, please? Where where can I put it? <laughs> Facebook group. Facebook group. All right. Bruce? What? Hold it up so we can see what it is again. 
uh, well, this is the Uranus locator chart. Okay, it's a PDF that I got from the Astronomical League, Mid-East Astronomical Region. And then this one is navigating the January night sky. Okay, those two are already on Facebook. Okay. But great. Groups IO uh, will be a good spot. And if you have them uploaded right now, you could post the link. If you, in fact, I'll just copy the link from Facebook and put it, and I'll put it in the chat right here. Okay. So uh, this, I learned something. So there's a, a, a download for files on the Facebook page. No, I, I made a post on the club page. Okay. Not the group site for the club, but the other one that the public could see is then normally the, the one that the public normally sees. And I uh, uh, okay. And All I right. Shared it to the group site. Okay. I will look for it there and learn something. Okay. All right. Um, and uh, item last, uh, again, since Bird isn't giving us in person school sky sky charts. Anybody get sky and telescope? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, magazine, they have a, f a f fold out. Yep. Uh, so, the, I use this every year. This is pretty awesome. Oh. This, this cool hourglass looking thing. So, yeah, this. I got it on my. Got on my wall back here. Yeah. Uh, Sky Gazer's Almanac for 40 degrees north, 2021. Basically, it's, you know, uh, short summer nights, long winter nights, and then everything that happens in between. So, uh, it, Jeff, did you get a, a, a bigger version of this? Uh, no. it's a, It was in the center pole of the magazine. Yeah. Woo, I center just pulled pole. it out and I put it on my wall Woo, so I can center look pole. see where everything's at in that particular night. Wow. This so is, that baby's got an hourglass figure. Woo, center <laughs> falls. Sorry, sorry, never mind. Uh, I'm gonna get in trouble. Sorry, baby guy. Don't hate. Anyhow, I'm done. Alrighty, and Bird isn't here right now. At least that I could see. Uh, is there any old business that needs covered? I don't have any. Bueller. I guess no. Is there any new business that anybody wants to cover? You want to hear about Cuneo's new observatory? It doesn't work. It doesn't work. He went and bought a knockoff of uh, uh, Astrodome out of Canada, a Filion or something, Who did? and the controller doesn't work. <laughs> so he's got three domes on top of an astronomical science building at Hampton University. Oh. With bad controllers. Yeah. Oh my. Yeah, I know. It's just I tried to save a couple thousand bucks and he got a piece of cheek. Oh. So we'll see. I try I proposed a new controller board that I, I designed and you know just just basic relay controller because it was frying the circuits. And the manufacturer said, No, no, we'll 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 swap it out, we'll get one. Well, it's been three months now and they still haven't even so he's dysfunctional. <laughs> Sounds like you need some octo isolators in there. Yeah, he needs a lot of things. I so I shared the picture of what he got, right? Did I last time? Or no? Uh... So I just posted to the group site the links, and I posted in the chat in here. You guys want to get those uh, PDFs? Thanks, Sean. You're welcome. And where's my money? <laughs> Take care of it. PayPal. Uh, I okay. got you. Rich is, Rich is handling you. I'm on it. Hey, he owes me money. <laughs> I'm supposed to be getting the checkbooks and everything soon. That's all right. I, I knew where. I knew where Richard Chuck lives, but I don't know where you live, but I'll find out. Remember, I have lots of guns. <laughs> Careful, you'll get in trouble. Have you guys already, uh, and I'm talking to you, Rich and Chuck and Jeff, about uh, setting up a day to meet at the bank? No. Oh, not yet. Do I have to be there? Do both of us have to be there? I don't think so. Um, 
If so, just let me know. I'll go up and ask him if, what all we have. Because it seems like every year we go up there, they change their requirements. Yeah. One year they had, they told us everybody. Then the next year they told us they only needed one. Yeah, I think the last time. Another year we went up the there same and they pack. told us you got to have everybody. Let me know. Um, do we have any other new business? Well, we can't just show up at the bank. We probably have to make an appointment because of the COVID stuff. That's true. Okay, go to observing reports. Anyone got an observing reports? Some of you got to have one. Observing reports. I have one. Who says, is that you, Robert? Yeah, uh, you can tell from my background here, we went to the uh, Crab Shack by the Bay, uh, by the James at uh, Huntington Park. People know where that is. Uh, Skywatchers and VPass, and I set up my telescope. And this is actually a video going on behind me that uh, uh, I took through my telescope with the same out, uh, setup that I used for taking moon pictures. And everybody there was getting pictures of the conjunction also. Oh, that's cool. Nice. Ooh. I see Jupiter. No, I set up. I was like, I sent an email to the V Pass asking if they were going to be at Huntington Park and nobody said anything. Because that would have been a perfect place to go. Well, the 21st was a complete cloud out. The 22nd, we rescheduled and made it for that day. And I also did a 23rd here in my yard. Yeah, Chuck and uh, Jeff Goldstein and Mel Spruill and I went out on the 22nd on a impromptu get together out at on Sandbridge Road by Red Mill, Red Mill Farms Park and Chuck was across the street at this construction site and we had good views of the conjunction and uh, several people came along we were able to show them too any other observing reports Last night, I saw three uh, open clusters, the Christmas tree cluster in Monoceros, uh, NGC 2232 in Monoceros, and NGC 2301 in Monoceros. And normally, I don't go to Monoceros because I can't even see any stars in Monoceros, but it's in between Orion and Gemini. And uh, there's a lot of things there if you can see them. Where was your location, George? The deck, my back deck, outside the back door. With you're in Virginia Beach, and you have a lot of light pollution there. Or? Yes, uh, even though it was a clear night, the cloud—I mean, the, the, there were no clouds, but the sky was very murky. I could, I could barely see Orion, and Orion usually shines mm -hmm. brightly. Uh, yeah, it, I was it, looking it, last night at seven thirty, and it was really clear here. I had to get my binoculars out, take a look at the clusters. And I hadn't seen it that clear in a long time, so I had to take advantage of it. Go ahead, Eddie. Yeah, I, I did an all, all nighter last night. I stayed out there, got uh, the sombrero, got that, got a good view of that. Um, and, and Orion, really, um, it was very clear. I mean, I, I'm out here in Salem, and, um, you know, I've got street lights, but, you know, shooting straight up and to the south and a little bit south southwest is pretty clear my problem is the south my southern exposure looks toward town center virginia beach <laughs> which is not very good for a light pollution it's terrible <laughs> now my, my western view is all pine trees <laughs> But uh, George, yeah, um, I wanted to meet you guys out there uh, on uh, the 21st. Uh, I was kind of getting a little panicky there. It was getting like sundown, didn't hear from you guys. So I met up with my neighbors in the circle and uh, they said, yeah, come on back to one of my neighbor's house and had a nice, uh, nice um, westerly view there. And uh, there was a, quite a few people there, uh, all my neighbors. Uh, uh, they never had seen through telescopes. They had a lot of questions. So it was good. It was good. Very cool. 
All right, well, if no one else has any other observer reports, uh, George has volunteered to give a presentation tonight in uh, conjunction with Jeff. Yeah, this is going to be interesting because I can't run it on my computer, so Jeff's running on his computer, and I'm going to have to tell him when to hit enter or hit advance the, advance the slide. Okay, you can advance the slide. Just keep hitting. There we go. We're going to talk about our moon and the tools of an astronomer. Go ahead. And this is a, if this looks familiar, you, some of you may have seen this, but I always start my presentations showing the BBA logo and our address and, and uh, post office box. And I usually introduce myself. Next. And if there's anybody working with me on a presentation, I'll put their members' names here as well. Next. And then I say astronomy is the science of objects outside Earth's atmosphere, stars, planets, galaxies, nebulas, and so forth. People ask, why can't I see any stars? This is what my backyard looks like. Sky glow, light pollution. Show them what it looks like, supposed to look like, Jeff. That's what it should look like. That is the Milky Way. People ask, how can I see in a dark sky? Well, there's three ways, naked eye, binoculars, and telescopes. Next, start. start Start with binoculars as a good way to see the stars, learn the constellations, and it's cheap, relatively cheap. A cheap pair of binoculars is better than a cheap telescope any day of the week. Does everyone see the presentation? Yes. Can anybody not see it? No, I see it. Yes, it's working for me. Okay. So you can see a lot with just your naked eye. There are, go ahead to the next slide. There are 88 constellations. We can see about 60, 63 of them here from the Northern Hemisphere. And just like you have tools or equipment for finding your way on the ground, you have maps, you have a compass. Astronomers have tools too for stargazing. What are some of our tools? Star charts, the planisphere, moon map. Cell phone. Let's talk about the moon. It's the easiest thing. In fact, when I first started out in astronomy 20 years ago, I started out trying to see the, the Messier objects and I got so frustrated I couldn't see anything. You got to train your eyes to see those dim objects. So I decided I'm going to look at something that I can see. So I worked on and earned the lunar certificate. So that's something you can see most nights and sometimes during the day. Next slide. And what's a moon? It's a natural satellite that orbits a planet. Okay. Our moon, our Earth's moon is called, uh, we call it the moon with a capital M. Its name is Luna. That's where we get lunacy and lunatic, people who are moonstruck. And it's about one fourth the size, the diameter of the Earth. Next. And here's some pictures, a lunar eclipse, phases of the moon, craters on the moon. There are mountain ranges on the moon. The mountain ranges are named after mountain ranges on the earth, the Andes, the Pyrenees, the Caucasus mountains. Next. Now, can you see, hit, click next slide. Can you see the man in the moon, the woman in the moon? How about the rabbit in the moon, the cow jumping over the moon? Next slide. Let's talk about the man and moon. Can you see it? That's a, a, a rough depiction of it. There's a, let it, keep, let it run. Now, can you see it without that? Can you picture the man and moon? You might have to squint a little bit. You can see that looking at the moon naked eye. Hit the next slide. 
Here's a better depiction, sort of highlights the dark and light areas. There's the man's face in the moon, the man in the moon. It's harder to see when it's totally lit up. Okay, next, the woman in the moon. There she is. That, that pearl necklace of hers is the crater Tycho. I cannot look at the moon without seeing the woman in the moon. How about the rabbit? Fat little bunny, so you've got a little tail, a little nose, ears. It's a chubby little bunny. Now this, you really have to use your imagination, the cow jumping over the moon. Some people say that it looks like a long skinny rabbit. <laughs> okay, next. Okay, when you see the full moon, you can't see a whole lot of detail because there are no shadows to show uh, 3D images. But there are those dark areas are dry seas of lava that have solidified over millions of years. Click. Mari Chrysium, the Sea of Crises out there on the right. Next, Mari Tranquilitatis or the Sea of Tranquility. That's where the Apollo 11 astronauts landed. Sea of Serenity, Mari Serenitatis. Next, Mari Nubium, the Sea of Clouds. Mari Imbrium, the Sea of Rains. And up above that is the Bay of Rainbows. And over to the left, the large area, the Oceanus Procellarum, the ocean of storms. Our ancient ancestors thought the moon had water just like the Earth. Is there going to be a test on this? Uh, well, I didn't make up a test, but I can do that. <laughs> I know. You, you pass it. <laughs> pass. <laughs> okay, there's a couple major craters that you can see during a full moon, and that's Tycho and, and Copernicus. And off to the left of Copernicus is uh, uh, Kepler, and up to the upper, not back up, up to the uh, upper left of Kepler is Aristarchus. So there's several bright craters you can see, but most of the craters you need to see during a time when the moon is not full. We'll see some pictures of that later. Next. And here is a, an annotated, you probably can't read it, but. Uh, uh, it's annotated with the names of the seas and the mountain ranges and some of the major craters. More moonshots. Gassendi crater, click. That's Gassendi. And the one next to it is Mersinius. And the other picture is some craters on the far side of the moon. Next. And uh, there are collapsed lava tubes that make valleys and rills. And there are valleys between mountains. I believe this is uh, on the right is the uh, Valles, Mar uh, Valles Alpen, Alpus, the Alpine Valley. Next. And here's what the moon looks like when it's not full. Now, ignore that. Did you see the moon and Venus two nights ago? That was, uh, this is an old slide. I haven't re-updated re it. Next slide. And this is, uh, this was uh, another picture, not the best picture of the moon. Next, the 60 day old moon. Now we explored the moon in the 60s and 70s. And in 69, the first men landed on the moon, the Apollo program. And there's the Saturn V rocket. Next, the uh, Apollo 11 new lunar module is picture taken uh, from the command module as it was coming back. And the people sometimes ask, can you see the flag on the moon? No way, it's too small. But the uh, Keck telescope on the top of Mauna Kea in Hawaii was able to see this telescopic view of the basis, the base of the Apollo 17 lunar module where it takes off and goes back up, it leaves the ba base. Click and it'll zoom in a little bit. That little shadow there is the base of this Apollo 17 lunar module after the module took off and went back 
to join up with the command module. Next. Okay, here's some features. This is a better picture of a moon with a div division between the daytime and the nighttime on the moon. That's called the terminator. And it's best to see uh, the craters and the mountains because they stand out in 3D because of the shadows. And these are some of the named craters and features that you can see. Next. That's that six day old moon. It's a waxing crescent moon. Here's some lunar explora exploration dates. The ranger uh, took pictures of the moon preparing uh, to choose landing sites for the Apollo program as, and the surveyor did the same thing. Then the Apollo program from 68 to 72. Clementine orbiter from uh, started in 94. The lunar reconnaissance orbiter has been up there since 2009. It's still going strong and it's got part of it as the uh, mini uh, uh, RF uh, radio frequency transmitter. Moon mineralogy mapper it was also part of the LRO and L cross <coughs> lunar. Oh, I forgot what all that. That's a I forgot what that acronym stands stands for. Anyway, those are some past lunar ex exploration uh, dates and and objects. Next, and we are going back to the moon. I hope this new administration continues the, the direction because Artemis is the program and Artemis was the twin sister of Apollo and we had the Apollo program already. Next. The Artemis program, NASA is going to land the first woman and the next man on the moon shooting for 2024. Next. And we'll be collaborating with uh, commercial and uh, international partners. Next. And we'll use what we learn on and setting up a colony on the moon, or at least a, a, a outpost on the moon to practice what we're going to do when we go to Mars. Okay, that's the end, but it's actually only beginning, the new beginning of a new exploration. Next slide. Hey, this is what the night sky looks like. If you look straight up, you'll see uh, Orion, off to the lower left of Orion is uh, Canis Major, the big dog. Gemini, the twins, up to the upper left. The uh, Pentagon is uh, Origa, the charioteer. Below him is uh, Taurus, the bull. In between them, up above, is Perseus, the hero. Off to the right of Perseus is Pegasus, the winged horse. Cassiopeia is above them. Cepheus, the king, is above them. And up at the top, there's Draco the dragon, the Big Dipper, and the Little Dipper. And the North Star is in the handle of the Little Dipper. Next. Now, have you had enough or you want to know more about moons? Okay, yeah, let's, let's keep going. Let's find out what causes phases of the moon. Go. Okay, here's the Earth-Moon system. Click. Let's see what causes the moon to have phases. As the moon orbits the earth, it rotates once on its axis every 29 days. That's why we always see the same face of the moon. But the phases of the moon are caused by sunlight shining on the moon's surface. Get, click the next slide, it shows a little bit better. Oh, wait, the, earth, the, the, the moon revolves around the earth in 29 and a half days. It rotates in about the same pick, uh, fi, uh, time period. It's tidally locked, which means the same side always faces the Earth. Next. A little bit better pick, a little better picture shows a graphic of the Earth and where the sun is in relation to the moon. And then it shows around that what we see when we're looking up at the moon. On a new moon, that means the moon is between us and the sun, full moon. Moon is on the opposite side of the Earth and anywhere in between. Next. Okay, click once. That's the one day old moon, a two day old moon, three day. No, only click once, I said. <laughs> click once. Okay, one day old moon, two day old moon, three, four, five, six. At about seven days, that's about half full or first quarter. Then we have an eight day old moon. Nine, you clicked again. You did, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> you quit clicking. 
Oh, well, just forget it. Go to the next slide. That, that's what's next. I see. Anyway, our moon is fascinating. It's got phases. It's got a wobble. It, uh, it has tight. If you were able to look down on the Earth and see the moon as it goes around the Earth and as Earth goes around the sun, the moon looks like it's doing a spiral. It has lunar eclipses when the Earth's shadow covers the moon. And because the moon is about the same relative size of the sun from our vantage point, we have, it can cover the sun, make a solar eclipse once or twice a year. And we've had exploration missions to the moon and around the moon. Next. Okay. Want to know, want to know some more? <laughs> okay. People sometimes ask, why don't we have an eclipse every month? That's because the moon's orbit is tilted about five degrees. So only about twice a year does it actually line up with the sun and cause a solar eclipse somewhere on the earth. Next. Now, our planet is not the only one with moons. How many planets are there in our solar system? Eight. Anybody know? Yeah, officially eight. Go to the next slide. Here's your quiz. What's, what's that thing in the middle? Click. That's the Earth. Earth's in the middle. <laughs> right. <laughs> Copernicus. It's Copernicus. <laughs> Click. Okay, next okay, slide. That's the sun. Okay, the Maybe first sun. planet after the sun, click. Mercury. There's Mercury. The second planet. There's Venus. Third rock from the sun. Earth. The fourth planet. The Mars, Mars, the red planet. The fifth one, a little farther away. Jupiter, the biggest of them all. Next, the ring planet. Saturn and its rings. And what's out beyond Saturn? Next planet is Uranus. Some people say Uranus. Some people say Uranus. Uranus sounds the least offensive. And the next planet out from that one is Neptune. And those are the eight planets. But still, Pluto is still out there. Click. Poor Pluto, it sort of shrunk down to a minor planet, but it's still out there, so don't worry about it. And we got some beautiful pictures of it from the new Horizon spacecraft. Next slide. And there, this is this slide, I tried to update this in, in the PowerPoint. Uh, Microsoft PowerPoint wouldn't let me update this slide. There are actually about 195 now noted that the uh, moon's orbiting different planets and dwarf planets. Some have been discovered by our own telescopes on Earth. What happened? I was going to not modify it. 195? No, 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 no. Don't, don't, don't. Oh, okay, don't. okay. Sorry, oh, sorry. Okay. I'll go back. Okay. And the most of the moons have been discovered by spacecraft going out beyond the planets. Next. Now these, the eight official planets, Mercury has zero, Venus has zero, Earth has one moon, Mars has two little moons, Jupiter has the last count, 79 moons, Saturn 62 moons, Uranus 30, 27 moons, Neptune 14, and our, there's five dwarf planets, I should have updated that slide, Pluto, it had three moons, click, then it had four moons, click, Pluto has five moons. We'll see some pictures of them in a minute. Eris, dwarf planet, has a moon. Ceres, the biggest uh, the besides Pluto, is uh, has no moons. Haumea has two. Make Make has one. And Kwawar has one. Next. Okay, we'll talk about the planets. Mars has two moons. Phobos and Deimos, or Deimos. Next. Those two moons. Deimos and Phobos, click. Astronomers think they're small asteroids that were captured by the gravity of Mars. Phobos is really close to the planet. Deimos is really farther away. Next. And uh, here's a picture of Mars' moons in the astronomy picture of the day for, from several years ago. And those moons are called Deimos Panic and Phobos Fear. Next. 
Here's a close up of them. Demos and Phobos are the mythical sons of Ares. Ares is the Greek god of war, and it's also the uh, Greek name for the planet Mars. Roman name for the god of war is Mars. Okay, Jupiter has a bunch of moons. Uh, not all of them have names. They've got Metis and Adrastea, Amalthea, Phoebe, Io, Europa, Ganymede, Callisto, Leda, Hamalia, Lysithia, Elara, a, a bunch of others. <laughs> Keep going. And a lot of them have numbers. Now, Galileo was the first one to discover the first four moons of Jupiter, Io, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto. And we like to see those when we look at Jupiter in our telescopes. I eat green at, cheese. Those are the ones we can see. Yes. Next. Those four Galilean moons were discovered over 400 years ago with a very primitive telescope. Click. Here's what we see through a telescope when we look at Jupiter and its four moons. Next. Here's Hubble Space Telescope view of the four moons. And because we've had satellites go out beyond them, we've got even clearer pictures. Next. Jupiter has 69 other moons besides those four. And this is a, a composite picture of some of the astronauts as if it was as if you were on one of the moons from Cal Callisto. Click. Now other moons were discovered by spacecraft. The Voyager, Galileo orbited uh, Jupiter for about eight years in our ground base observatories. Next. And of course, the Hubble Space Telescope. And when after it was launched in 1990 and repaired in 1993, it, it has revolutionized our knowledge of astronomy. Next. Okay, Saturn has a bunch of moons too. I'm not going to go through the list. You can read those if you want to. Uh, ones that you'll hear often mentioned are Enceladus, which has uh, ice volcanoes. Uh, Ray and Tethys and Dione are pretty large, and you can sometimes see those. And Iapetus is a weird one. It's got half white, half light, and half dark. Next. Saturn's famous for its rings, got 62 moons. Titan is its largest moon, and it has an atmosphere of methane gas. The Cassini spacecraft uh, arrived at Jupiter in uh, 20, 2005 or 2006, I believe, and the Hig it launched the Huygens probe, which landed on the surface of Titan, and uh, it taught us a lot about, showed us pictures and taught us a lot about what's on Titan, the methane gas atmosphere and the ethane lakes. Next. Here's a montage of Saturn's six largest moon, Dione, Tethys, Mimas, Enceladus, Ray, and Titan. Here's two views of Titan, two different views. One was uh, taken uh, a little bit closer. And you can see it does, it looks sort of fuzzy because of its atmosphere. Next. The Cassini spacecraft launched the Huygens probe that's it in the lower left as it going down. Take another click. It shows a graphic of the probe landing tra trajectory. It deployed a parachute and then it, it landed softly on the surface. Next. This is a gra uh, artist's con conception of how it would have looked. Next. And these are some actual pictures that the uh, Titan or the uh, Huygens probe took of Titan on its way down. It saw islands of ice and surface features and rocks and, or, well, ice, mountains and uh, water ice and methane ice, methane lakes and methane rivers. Next. Some other moons of Saturn Hyperion, Iapetus, Helena, Mimas, Dione. Next. Uranus has a bunch of moons, and they're named after uh, Shakespeare characters. Cordelia, Ophelia, Bianca, Cressida, Desdemona, Juliet, Portia, Rosalind, and a bunch of others. Next. Uranus is the seventh planet. It's unique in that it's tipped on its side. It rotates 90 degrees opposite of what ours 
our rotation is, it has 27 known moons, has a ring system that we can't see. It's the only evidence of a ring system was seen with the Voyager spacecraft. Next. Uranus has a, a bunch of moons, what did I say, 27, and uh, Titania is the largest, it's about half the size of our moon. And those are the five largest moons of Uranus, from left to right are Miranda, Ariel, Umbriel, Titania, and Oberon. There's a close-up view of Titania, I believe. Next, Neptune had, I think, 14 moons, and uh, it's uh, been named after Goddess, gods or goddesses, Nathanaid, Thalassa, Despina, Galatea, Larissa, Proteus, Triton, and Nereia. Triton is the largest of the Neptune moons. Next. Neptune has 14 moons and they're composed of rock and ice. Uh, the first four so close to the planet that uh, they orbit within its ring system. The next one out, Larissa was actually discovered in 81 and is rediscovered by Voyager 2 in 89. And Proteus is the second largest moon in orbit around Neptune. It's so close to the planet that Earth, Earth-bound telescopes can't even see it. it was, it's been seen by spacecraft. Neptune's largest moon is Triton. It's one of the strangest moons. It's only one of only three moons in the solar system with an atmosphere. And uh, the other thing is it's got a retrograde orbit. It orbits the opposite way of the spin of the planet. So it may have been captured some, at some point millions of years ago by the planet. And it's two thirds the size of our moon. Next. And planets with moons, or even it's a dwarf planet, but we still love Pluto. It started out with a large moon, Charon or Charon, and Nix and Hydra. Charon was discovered in 1978. Nix and Hydra were discovered in 19, or 2005. And then there was another one they discovered in 2011. They called it P4. Another one they discovered a little while later. Next, P, they called it P5. It was also discovered in 2011. So you'll see that they did finally, or it was 2012. They finally did give those P4 and P5 names. We'll see that in the next, not the next slide, but one after that. Next. Even though it's been downgraded, poor Pluto. It had three moons. No, it's got four. No, it's got five moons. That's Charon. Charon, the largest moon. It's half the size of Pluto. And in May 2005, two more moons were discovered. Click. And they're called Nix and Hydra. Initially, they were called candidate moons. But after being verified, they get they got named Nix and Hydra. Next, there they are again, another picture. Nix. Now, in July 2012, astronomers found a fifth moon. They found that fourth one and the fifth moon, and those two. New moons, I don't know if you can see it because I, I can't see it because of my uh, mute stop video line underneath, but uh, uh, that line says that those last two moons were named Styx and Kerberon. Styx and Kerberon. So we got Charon, Nix, Hydra, Styx, and Kerberon. Five moons around little dwarf planet Pluto. Next. Pluto isn't the only dwarf planet has moons. Eris, Quawar, and Makimaki Maki have at least one. Haumea has at least two. Next. Well, I think we're finally done. Next. So let's summarize. There are at least 195 moons orbiting planets and dwarf planets. Some have been discovered by Earth-bound telescopes. Some have been seen by the Hubble Space Telescope. And many have been discovered by spacecraft exploring the heavens. That's the story of the moons. Space, the final frontier.
these are the voyages of the amateur astronomer. That's it. <laughs> All right. Very good. Thank you, George. Very good. You can stop oh, sharing here. I will. There we go. Does anybody have any questions for George from the first Yeah, table? I've got one question for you, George. Um, okay. They've discovered, at least the story goes, they've discovered uh, H2O ice yeah. and what, some of the craters on the shadow side of the moon. At least that's the, what I've been hearing. Can you? Well, it's not the shadow right? side of the moon, it's the poles of the moon, because there is no shadowed side of the moon. We, when they think of the, when they no. talk, Dark I'm, side of the moon is the far I'm, side. I'm talking about inside the craters. Inside the craters, point. inside craters that never see the sunlight. There are some craters, especially near the North Pole and the South Pole of the moon, that never get any sunlight at all. And they, the satellites have been orbiting the L cross and lunar orbiter, lunar reconnaissance orbiter, LRO, uh, have detected vast quantities of ice in those areas. So if we go to the moon, there, there's a possibility of tapping that ice as a source of water. Okay, thank you. George, I got a question for you. Okay. So thinking about this, if the moon is at the first quarter in the Northern hemisphere, we see it differently than they see it in the Southern hemisphere? We see the same phase, but when in, you're in the southern hemisphere, it looks upside down. Uh, if you see Orion in the sky up here, go down to the southern hemisphere, Orion is standing on his head. It's, it's like people on the southern hemisphere, they're standing. I don't know why they don't fall off. <laughs> they're upside down. <laughs> Thanks. I always wondered about that. Well, you also yeah. talked about moons in our solar system. We have discovered exomoons now at, out of the Kepler data. That's right. Yes. Exoplanets. They've discovered about 3,000 exoplanets, planets around other stars. And some of those have actually detected moons around the planets. Yeah. David Kipling's group, he found at least one. He, he'd been hunting for moons in the data because it's a lot harder to detect based on the shape of the light curve um, from the transits. But they have discovered at least one that I know of. Uh, maybe yeah, the, a, difference, the difference between those guys and us amateur astronomers, we use our eyes to look through the telescopes at the stars and the planets. They use their computers to look at figures and graphs and paper. And now, that's not 100% true. Well, because things like Kepler and a lot of the survey data is open access to all. So there's a group of amateurs out there that do data mining of these surveys and make discovery. Um, I was on a call, actually, um, an ABSO presentation. We had this guy, he was a teenager from Russia who had personally discovered over um, 80 variable stars um, combing through different surveys. Um, I think he was, he was mainly using Atlas but he was looking through different surveys and then correlating them in. Um, and he was cross-checking them um, through the Sinbad database, which brings in a lot of different surveys to make sure they haven't been discovered and then putting his submissions in. Um, so yeah, it's definitely a different skill set from observing, but there are amateurs who are doing that and publishing and discovering things because the wealth of data that's out there, there's a lot of algorithms that comb that data that are made by, um, professionals, but we also find there's a lot of problems with those because a lot of the surveys, I know I'm getting way off topic, they, um, you know, their cadences are the same time periods. They look at the same periods of skies. Well, that leads to aliases. If you know about Fourier transforms, you can easily get false periods and misidentifying things. So a lot of times it takes humans to go through and actually look at the data and they can make better judgments and then do more refinements of the data going through. So there's a big push for amateur astronomers who can really help or have the time or the inclination to go through 
and properly identify stuff out of survey data because there's all this data out there, but data doesn't really do you any good until somebody actually looks at it and does something with it. Very good, very good. So the guy that you were talking about, Rich, that uh, found 80 variable stars, mm -hmm. does he name those stars? Yeah, he, his, his last name is Ron Mominoff. And so they're all like, if, if you go in the variable star index, um, they'll be like Rosmoninoff 20, Rosmoninoff 21. Uh, but they'll have catalog names too, because usually stuff is named by you know, their, their surveys. Um, and then they'll eventually get a variable star name, um, which there is a um, there's a whole convention to how variables are named. I don't know if I ever spat that one out for you guys in my variable star presentations. But. That sounds like a topic for another presentation. It's not a whole topic to make of how variables are named. Um, I could do it in two minutes. But. Speaking of that, though. With, well, if, if, if you want to know, they started R. So if you have a no, job. I mean, speaking of a presentation coming up from Rich for variable stars, we, we could use another one probably. It's been a while. Would, would you want a variable tar cover? Or maybe I go back to base science, like the nature of light, you know, since uh, I think I get, I got some eyes glazed over when I started doing um, spectral stuff. Um, last time when I was doing long period variables. Well, I know that figure out a good topic. I know that it would, uh, there's a lot of amateur astronomers that are interested in discovering things, being the first to discover something. And it seems that the subfield you're talking about is good for that. So promoting it yeah. is good. Yeah. Um, the other one that's real, um, real popular right now. And maybe I could set up, not me, but um, like Dennis Conti to do a presentation. He He's a um, section leader. Um, like I'm the AVSO's long period variable section leader. He's the exoplanet section leader. He has a pretty good presentation because um, you'd be surprised about um, how many people are actually out there doing um, exoplanet observations in not necessarily discovering new things, but the things that happened when we had Kepler up there and, and specifically TESS, they're, they're really um, bringing out a lot of candidates. Like George said, we've, um, I think, confirmed close to 4,000 exoplanets now out of the Kepler data, but they have about 20 to 30,000 that are potential. We think they might, but the Kepler data wasn't enough to confirm them. So they need people to do follow-up um, tests. They knew that they wouldn't be able to get confirmations out because it was doing the whole sky. I know mean, Kepler looked at one small section of the sky. Tess is looking at the whole sky. So they built, um, they built the program where Tess would go give potential targets and then they need amateurs with amateur equipment to go and verify them. They're also looking for people to do um, follow-ups on known exoplanets so that we could refine their ephemerises so that um, we can really train uh, get those transits down because James Webb when and if it ever gets in the sky is going to start looking at these planets and it's going to try to determine um, you know it's trying to compositions of atmospheres is one of the things that it's going to try to do so they don't want to waste time by looking at a target when it's not in the transit so they need um, refinements from amateurs. And they're saying uh, there's a wealth of targets that you could actually get with a, a six inch scope. If you have a six inch scope and you can track well, there's something like two or 300 high value targets that NASA is asking for. If you got a bigger scope, obviously there's more targets that you could go for. But hey, Rich, it's, um, Rich, it's something that's really being right now. Rich, when you get a chance, check the chat. Michael Lewis wants you to email him. Yeah, I saw that Michael was on. Uh, Michael, I uh, I got assigned to be his mentor on Variable Star observing uh, um, a few weeks ago because I'm in their uh, I'm in the mentor program. So if you go to the ABSO and say, "Hey, I I, I want to be mentored on how to observe variables," I'm one of the guys you may uh, may get. Well, obviously you would because you all know. 
and there's an AL program for variable star reserving. It's pretty easy. If you're able to set up something with uh, the guys, I don't remember the guys Dan you mentioned about exoplanets. Mm -hmm. Let me know because we definitely would like to have them. Yeah, I'll reach out to him um, to see if he'd be willing to, to do that. Give me uh, give us enough time to advertise so we see if we can get uh, not just, uh, plenty of club members, maybe the public too that wants to tune in. Yeah, when we did our section webinars, um, all the section leaders had to do do one for last year, and uh, most of us got like a hundred to two hundred people on. When um, Dennis did exoplanets, he had over five hundred people from across wow. the world that were interested in his uh, exoplanet talk. You know, it's it's an interesting topic. Yeah, he worked with um, a couple guys um, at UVA that wrote their own co um, code in Python that um, does the data reduction for you, um, specifically looking for exoplanet um, transits. And it has its own format that NASA is using to track um, their ephemeris. So it can, it can um, it's shoot, the output is ready to go right into their NASA database. Does anybody have uh, more questions for George? All righty. Well, well before, you, before you close the meeting, let me make one more push for the uh, Astronomical League observing programs. Our Alcor, Bruce Powers, wants you to uh, go to the astroleague.org website and check out those dozens and dozens of observing programs. Pick one that you want to try and you can earn a pin, you can earn a, uh, a certificate and you can get your name in the quarterly magazine of the Astronomical League. Anyone else? What George said. I got to go back. I, I Like George, I started the binocular missing program like three or four years ago. And I did like, I have like 46 of the 50 needed. And I got those 46 when I lived in Hampton. So I could probably, I picked up at least an extra magnitude since moving out of Nile White. Here's the magazine, I believe. Here it is. No. Doesn't have many. Well, this issue doesn't have a lot of back pay astronomers' names it, in the back. It used to be every quarter, it'd be about four or five back bay amateur astronomer names in there. Yeah. Hadn't yeah. Had any for several, several issues. It was probably Derby 10 awards. And he's com like completed every one. No, not, a, not by a long shot. All right, well. I'm wearing my uh, East Coast Star Party shirt, RIP. Thank you guys all for coming to the meeting. Jeff, you can uh, quit your recording.